very much. Um, so at, at 175, 178, and 180 of the Upper Tribunal's decision. Oh, I'll get it. Upper Tribunal, yeah. It essentially concludes in those paragraphs that the deficiencies in the Stratex invoices are fundamental uh, requirements, which it defines as requirements which are necessary for the taxing authority to monitor payment by the supplier, um, which are thus a necessary precondition for the right to deduct. Um, in our submission, as to the VRM, um, that is not an indispensable requirement. There was no VRM on the invoices in Cenotex. Uh, nor in Chemwater, but the court didn't indicate that that was a fundamental deficiency. Well, in Celotex, the VRN was supplied, but not in the invoice itself. It, it was subsequently corrected, yes, years after the, the, the right to deduct had arisen. Uh, but that was not the case in, in Chemwater. Um, and, it, and, and, and plainly, it, it follows from the decision in Senatex that it wasn't a fundamental requirement to the right to deduct because the court said uh, the right to deduct had to be exercised in the period in which the transactions took place, at which point there was no, no VRM. Um, uh, the reason why we say that the VRN is not a fundamental requirement is because what the taxpayer is required to demonstrate and all that the taxpayer is required to demonstrate is that the supplier is a taxable person. And here, as in Chemwater, that is something which necessarily followed from the circumstances of, of the case. Um, what we say the upper tribunal has in effect created is an additional substantive requirement, namely to demonstrate that the supplier was in fact that registered. Uh, and we say that that is not something which member states can do. Uh, similarly, uh, in Polsky, uh, the missing information was the customer name and address, and yet the court did not consider that to be a fundamental uh, deficiency. Um, and uh, we say, contrary to the upper tribunal's conclusion at 180, the absence of the customer name and address in this instance didn't present um, a risk of the Stratex invoices being used more than once um, because um, anyone looking to use the Stratex invoices to deduct <coughs> VAT would need to demonstrate that the substantive requirements were met. And the only person who could do that is Tower Bridge. <coughs> Similarly, we say uh, the fact that Stratex failed to account for the VAT is wholly immaterial to the analysis. What matters uh, is that the tax was passed on to CFE by Stratex and CFE duly paid it. So for all those reasons, we invite you to allow the appeal on ground one. Mm -hmm. In the alternative, um, our second ground of challenge is that in the circumstances of this case, where it's common ground that the substantive requirements are met, uh, the revenues discretion under Reg 29.2 to accept other evidence of the charge to VAT can only be exercised one way. Um, returning then to the upper tribunal summary of the relevant principles at 161 sub 7, the Upper Tribunal says that whilst evidence of payment of the tax is not necessarily required before the right to deduct can be exercised, it might be appropriate to require evidence of the payment of the tax before a discretion in favour of the taxpayer can be exercised. Uh, in our submission, the, the true position is that payment of the tax is not required uh, in order for the right to deduct arise. It is irrelevant to the right to deduct. Payment of tax by the supplier? Payment of tax by the supplier, yes. That is irrelevant uh, to the right to deduct. To, to deduct. Uh, and if that is an irrelevant consideration to the right to deduct, um, how can it be relevant to the exercise of the discretion under Reg 29.2? What we say Reg 29.2 establishes is a limited discretion on the part of the revenue 
to accept other documentary evidence of the charge to that. That is what the legislation says. And what that discretion is concerned with is alternative evidence that the substantive requirements have been met. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and as I said, in this case, it is common ground that the revenue have all the evidence they need to establish that, those, those requirements. Uh, and so the, ex the, the discretion can only be exercised in one, in, in one way. Where the upper tribunal went wrong was in 195 of its decision, where it concluded that the words evidence of the charge to that must be construed as extending to evidence establishing the formal requirements. And in our submission, there is uh, no basis for that construction. <coughs> First, we say that in the absence of a valid VAT invoice, what the taxable person is required to demonstrate is that the substantive uh, requirements are met, not provide evidence as to each of the formal this, requirements. This doesn't, this, that argument doesn't help you on this ground of appeal, because we only get to this ground of appeal if you're wrong on ground one. So to say that the taxable person doesn't need a, <coughs> um, a 226 invoice in order to exercise the right to deduct that assumes you win on ground one. So you, you have to assume for the purposes of this ground that you lose on ground one, so that in order to exercise the right to deduct as of right, the taxable person must have a 226 invoice. Uh, yes. Well, uh, yes. The point well, I'm putting to you. I, I do. I mean, this this ground obviously proceeds on 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 the assumption that we don't have a exactly. a, a right. So in we're words, into the in realm words, of as a matter of right, you cannot exercise the right to yes. deduction because you have not got a compliant invoice. Yes, but in our submission, the, the, what the discretion is aimed at is a discretion to accept alternative evidence that the substantive requirements are met. And in this case, that is true. That we have we have established that the substantive yeah. requirements are met. So the fact that we are, we don't have a valid VAT invoice is not um, a basis for refusing to exercise the discretion. In fact, that will always be the case in, in a Reg 29.2 situation. You only need the discretion when you when you don't have a valid yeah. VAT invoice. Um, so the, the second point we make is that the UK has chosen to implement its discretion by means of Reg 29.2, and it has limited its discretion to accepting alternative evidence of the charge to VAT. Now, in our submission, that can only sensibly be taken to mean alternative evidence that the substantive requirements are met, because the formal requirements have no bearing on the charge to VAT. Formal requirements are uh, aimed at or perform a different function altogether. They are intended to enable the tax authorities to monitor the transactions. And as the AG in Barlis explains, once it has been shown that the substantive requirements are met, the tax authorities have everything they need to monitor uh, the transactions. So the formal requirements are at that point otios. Uh, nor, we say, are any of the factors relied upon by the revenue for <coughs> relevance here. So the first is, the, the, the first factor they rely on is that the invoices were invalid, and as I said, that will always be the case. Um, at, uh, at paragraphs 201 and 202, um, the upper tribunal indicated that the particular deficiencies um, in the Stratex invoices presented a heightened or clear indication of fraud. Um, but as regards the VRN, we say that it was perfectly possible uh, that the omission of the VRN was as a result of a simple oversight. And indeed, when CFE requested corrected invoices, they were assured that those invoices would be provided. But in any event, the upper tribunal's conclusion in that regard is contrary to the FTT's finding that CFE had neither knowledge nor means of knowledge of the fraud. So the omission of the VRN was not something uh, that could have or should have uh, or did 
alert CFE to the fraud. Um, nor we say is it correct to conclude that the failure to include the customer name and address um, presented a real and obvious risk of fraud. Uh, and in that regard, the upper tribunal's reliance on the Boyce decision, we say, is misplaced. The issue in Boyce was that the invoices were issued in the name of third parties, um, and that those third parties had been instructed by the taxpayer to purchase the inputs on, on his behalf. Now, in that scenario, uh, the risk of fraud by duplicate claims is, is obvious. In the present case, however, there is no such risk of fraud because there was no customer name and address provided. So the only person who can establish that the substantive requirements are met in this case, i.e. the only person who can establish that they were the customer, is Tower Bridge. Secondly, uh, the fact that Stratex was not that registered, again, we say, is completely irrelevant. What matters is that Stratex was a taxable person and that is not a point in dispute here. The third factor relied upon is the fact that the transactions were connected to fraud. And again, we say that that is an irrelevant factor unless it is shown that the taxpayer has knowledge or means of knowledge. Uh, and then fourthly, the revenue relied on the fact that uh, there was a perceived lack of um, failure to carry out a reasonable level of due diligence. Uh, and again, we say that is an irrelevant factor. As the case law demonstrates, the taxpayer is not required to carry out extensive checks, and it is not therefore open to the revenue to impose a higher level of due diligence on the appellant, simply because as it transpired, uh, but unbeknownst to the appellant at the time, the transactions were connected with fraud. So in our submission, to refuse to exercise uh, the discretion in circumstances where it is common ground that the substantive requirements are met, um, in effect, imposes a penalty on the appellant of the sort described by the court in Bonnock and Ferrame. Uh, the revenue are essentially visiting the burden of Stratex's default on Tower Bridge, having failed to establish knowledge or means of knowledge of the fraud, and we say that they are not uh, permitted to do that. So for all those reasons and in the alternative, we invite you to allow the appeal on ground two. <coughs> so thank you very much for your yes. indulgence. Would you be kind enough to send in um, soft copies of your key principle document? Certainly. My Lords. Uh, the issue in this case has been traversed many times. Uh, position in UK law is now settled as a result of the Zipbit decision, um, as also considered in the Royal Mail litigation. The present appeal is on all fours with the Zipbit matter in all material respects. If further confirmation of the position were required, then one only need to look to the Advocate General's opinion in Zipfit, which draws the threads together and provides an affirmation of the, um, the approach taken uh, by the UK courts. Uh, the Court of Appeal judgment in Zipfit is not wrong and it applies directly in this case. The question was posed just before lunch Have Ferramet and Kenwater changed the landscape? No, they haven't. But not in the UK. They postdate the IP completion date and are therefore not binding on this court. Have they even changed the position in so EU? Just, just pause, pause a moment. As I understand it, the decision of the Court of Justice in Zipnit is binding because a reference was made for IP completion date. <coughs> I couldn't find the bit of the act that says that, but that's certainly my understanding. Yes, but that, that's my understanding. Um, I'll get my team onto it. Perhaps your team could supply the answer. Yes, yes. thank you. <coughs> um, 
But is uh, are Ferronet and Kenwater have they even changed the landscape in terms of EU law? Well, there's no advocate general's opinion in either of those cases. The court therefore was acting on the basis it was restating the existing law and not establishing new law. Is that right? What's, <coughs> what's the authority for that? I mean, I'm sure. And there's another situation, which is where the court proceeds in an even more summary fashion by producing a reasoned opinion. Yes. And that, I'm, I'm pretty clear, is confined to cases where the court takes the view that there's no room for any doubt about the answer. <coughs> I, but we're in a kind of intermediate position here. <coughs> yes. Lord, I don't have uh, the authority to my fingertips. Mm. Um, it's the, the generally taken position. But in any event, we can demonstrate that the position hasn't changed. Well, I think your, your point is quite an important one. So if there is some more worry yes. about it, I think we'd like to know what it is. Yes, absolutely. The Kenwater is parasitic on Ferrimet. No other case was cited. Ferrimet is a reverse charge case. And when it talks of formal conditions, it cannot be referring to the conditions under Article 226. Turning to Ferrimet, and paragraph 26. First sentence records this, that it should therefore be recalled in the first place that the right to deduct VAT is subject to compliance with material as well as formal conditions. So the, 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 bold, state, the bold statement there, one does have to take into account both, both the uh, formal and the material conditions. Further reference to paragraph 31. <coughs> the right to deduct, the middle of the fourth line, the right to deduct provided for in Article 167 is an integral part of the VAT scheme and in principle may not be limited if the material and formal requirements or conditions to which this right is subject are respected by taxable persons. Incidentally, the case there cited presumably was a reasoned order type of case, so that was regarded as, a, at any rate, as a clear proposition of the law. Yes, my lord. Um, uh, the, the Vinkingo, Vikingo, uh, matter. Uh, yes. <laughs> The uh, paragraph 34, also on that page, where the tax authorities have the information necessary to establish that the substantive requirements have been satisfied, they cannot, in relation to the right of a taxable person to deduct that tax, impose additional conditions. Well, those additional conditions cannot be a reference to Article 226. They must be a reference to national law. Well, they can't be reference to 226 in Ferrimet because 226 didn't apply. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so turning then to Kenwater, which was a 226 case. Kenwater isn't a reverse charge case, but the only authority that it refers to is Ferrimet. In paragraph 24, on page 575, 
first sentence, on page 575 of paragraph 24, it should be recalled that the right to deduct VAT is subject to compliance with material as well as formal conditions. Paragraph 25, it's recorded that the naming of a supplier is a formal condition. And then in paragraph 27. Well, except in the end of, towards the end of paragraph 24, it says that's the detailed rules governing the exercise, which may be considered formal conditions, and it refers to 178 yes. and yes. the invoice in accordance with 226. Absolutely. So it's, it's then pivoted away from Ferramat and and they said well, this, can, this applies to, to Article 226, yeah. um, to the Article 226 situation. But there's no other authority cited there. So the, uh, that, that last part of 24 is, so to speak, a bridge between Ferramet and... Well, the Ferramet. attempted bridge, yeah. The yes. attempted bridge. Um, but there's no examination of any of the authorities before Ferramet. This long line of matters going back to Junon. Um, Cases that have traversed this subject exhaustively are simply not considered. And if this case is being put forward as the as the new broom that sweeps away <coughs> the old law, that is surprising. Is it not normal for VAT cases in the European Court to be dealt with by Chamber of Only Three? I mean, these, a lot of these most recent cases seem to be. I don't know whether that's a change of practice or just a result of pressure of work or trying to reduce backlogs or what? Is it just I, I don't know the answer to that, my lord. Um, anyway, I'm, no. so, I'm sorry, I can't answer. There, there maybe, the, maybe there is no published answer, it's just an observable fact. Yes. And it's paragraph 27. Um, in the middle of the fourth line, right of deduction for is provided for in Article 167, an integral part of that scheme, and in principle may not be limited if the material and formal requirements or conditions to which this right is subject are respected by taxable persons. Now, we appreciate that that's inconsistent with what, what comes later. But it adds rather to the oddity of this decision. If we then move to the conclusion of paragraph 40, sorry, Kenwater. <coughs> the conclusion in paragraph 40 is, is a cumulative one. To deny a taxable person the right to deduct VAT on the ground that true supplier of the goods or services concerned has not been identified, and that that taxable person had not proved that the supplier was a taxable person, when it clearly follows from the factual circumstances that the supplier necessarily had that status, it would be contrary to the principle of fiscal neutrality. Uh, the case law. <coughs> well, the case law that's referred to is simply paramount. Um, but it, it's it's a cumulative condition, so cannot deny simply on the basis that uh, the supplier has not been identified and that that taxable person has not produced, or not proved that the supplier was taxable. So therefore, the supplier cannot be required in every case to prove that the, the supplier is taxable. That's what it goes on to say. Um, in order to exercise that right, the taxable person cannot be required in every case to prove where the true supplier of the goods or services concerned has not been identified that the supplier has the status of taxable person. So it is not um, definitive, even then. But it, if we apply what the court said in paragraph 40, then surely Tower Bridge does get the right to deduct because it, it, um, it necessarily follows from the factual circumstances of this case that its supplier was a taxable person. 
Majesty or not. There were two um, glaring deficiencies with the invoices in Tower Bridge. Not only the absence of the VRF, a flat registration number, but also the absence of the details of the trust number, which of course raises, and I know this is a matter that my only friend disagrees with me, but we say that that raises the possibility that that invoice can be used more than once and therefore assist the fraud. My own friend says, well, only Tower Bridge can, um, can demonstrate that it, um, it received these supplies. That doesn't preclude the same invoice being used with somebody else because Tower Bridge's name is not, it is not on it. And the upper tribunal took account of both matters in its judgment. So Ken Water does not deal at all with the requirement to name the customer on the invoice. Moreover, it did not deal at all with the monitoring function that is referred to in a number of the authorities. And lastly, these two cases did not establish the appellant's fundamental proposition that there's really no need to comply with the formal conditions at all. So, you may have regard, of course, to Fermat and Ken Walter, but we say that even in EU law terms, they don't get the appellant where it Let me now briefly consider the Advocate General's opinion in Zitbit. Can, can we just pause a moment? Um, simply from a matter, from the point of view of precedent, we are bound by Zitbit yes. in this court. Yes. Uh, the Advocate General's opinion in Zitbit is persuasive. Yes. As all advocate generals' opinions ever were, we may have regard to uh, Ferramet and uh, Kenwater, but are not yes. bound by them. That's correct, my lord, yes. Is that another exception to Young and Bristol aeroplanes? I mean, suppose that we were to conclude that. There is a conflict between Zipvit binding on us and the later two CJEU cases not binding on us. Then what? We have to follow Zipvit. <laughs> 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 um, unless you're satisfied that Zipvit is clearly wrong, then it is binding. Um, Sorry. And, yeah, yeah, my lord. No, sorry, I don't want to, uh, just a further point about Zipid as binding authority has just occurred to me. Can we just, just pause on this side? I mean, certainly, as the decision itself stood, it, it was the binding, indeed it was the ratio of the case. We have, I mean, that's the basis on which we decided the case, having said if it was a matter of the other first issue, that would have to go to yeah. Europe. However, um, the case has now been finally decided by the Supreme Court on the basis of what the ECJ, the CJEU, said on the Zipfit reference, which decided the case entirely on the mm -hmm. first issue and said nothing at all about the second issue. Correct. So where does that leave the binding status or otherwise of what yeah. we said uh, in Zipfit, which was necessary to our ratio as we then conceived the case to be? But that basis has now been undermined um, on the footing that, in any event, um, the taxpayer didn't get home because it's, it's 
earlier on the first issue. Just, just picking up my Lord's point, I think the Supreme Court is going to deliver itself of a judgment tomorrow, oh. raising pretty much this <laughs> question where the question arose, I think, in the EAT, and there had been a Court of Appeal decision which went to the Supreme Court, I think, rather than the House of Lords, and was decided on a slightly different point. Yes. I think, I think this question of of court of appeal, the states base. of court of appeal decisions is is going to be literally decided tomorrow. <laughs> well, <very interesting>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to, to duck the question, um, but my answer is that there is a consistent approach in EU law, yeah. which the court of appeal in Ziff is acted upon, and which is not undermined by anything. So, it, so picking again, picking up my Lord's point, you're not necessarily saying that Zipfit <coughs> on the invoice issue is binding. I think I'm probably driven to that because of the, mm. the because of it going to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yes. Um, All right. Yeah. But I, we see this direction of travel um, within the EU authorities taking us. And then it's drawn together in the AGO's opinion in Zipfit, um, which makes sense, we would submit, uh, of what has gone before. So if I may take your lordships, please, to the AG's opinion, page 594, volume 2. Page 594, paragraph 63. In the final analysis, it's precisely the invoice must be held in accordance with Article 178A of the VAT Directive that is the means provided for by that directive by which the charge to VAT is passed on from the supplier which is liable for the payment of the tax to the recipient of the supply party price in a manner that is verifiable for all parties concerned including the tax authority only then is the recipient of the supply able to see how much the supplier believes he or she should be charged for so, in the phrase, in a manner that's verifiable for all parties concerned, including the tax authority. We then move, please, to paragraph 68 on the following page. Paragraph 68. Furthermore, as already stated by the court, there's then a reference to easel, only the possession of an invoice allows the tax authority to monitor payment of the VAT and the input tax deducted. The more details the invoice contains, the more effective the monitoring by the tax authorities of the very comprehensive list now included in Article 226 of the Directive. This also <coughs> suggests that the possession of an invoice stating VAT is the decisive factor and thus constitutes a substantive requirement for the deduction of input tax therefore not possible for the applicant to deduct input tax without such an invoice. And that's then elaborated upon. Um, we turn then, please, to paragraph 79 on page 590. in a section that deals with the case law on this subject. Thus, the case law only refers to the absence of certain formal requirements, not to the absence of all formal requirements. <coughs> it cannot therefore be concluded from that case law that a right of deduction can arise if no invoice is held. The court itself only notes that holding an invoice showing the details mentioned in Article 226 is a formal condition, not a substantive condition the right to deduct VAT. That observation is correct. The provision of all the information specified in Article 
they form a requirement. Provided it is not essential to explain the point 81, that information may also be added or amended at a later date. And then just going down to paragraph um, 80. The court also concludes that the finding, from that finding, that the tax authority cannot refuse the right to deduct VAT on the sole ground, for example, that an invoice does not satisfy the conditions required by Article 226. Six and seven of the back of that book, in brackets, precise description of the quantity and nature of the supply and date of the supply. If they have available all the information to ascertain whether the substantive conditions for that right are satisfied. The same applies to the information that is mentioned in Article 2263, supplier's VAT identification number, or Article 2262, invoice number. Interestingly, not included in that non essential section is the customer's identity. Then at 81. This is convincing. A document that charges for a supply of goods or services is in fact a, an invoice within the meaning of Article 178A of the VAT Directive. If it enables both the recipient of the supply and the tax authorities to establish uh, which supplier has passed on to which recipient of the supply, which amount which transaction and when it is done so. so that, that's the statement of the, the key to the essential information. That means it needs to state the supplier, the recipient of the supplier, the goods or services supplied, the price and the VAT, which must be set for state separately. As I've stated elsewhere, if those five essential items of information are provided, the spirit and purpose of the invoice is fulfilled and the right to deduction ultimately arises. Failure to comply with the other requirements specified in Article 226 of the VAT Directive does not preclude the right of deduction, provided they are corrected in the administrative or court proceeding. So that's an important proviso from your perspective. It, it is, it, <coughs> absolutely, because the absence of the VAT number couldn't be corrected. So um, Semitex was a case where the VAT number was provided. Absolutely, yes. One of those many cases in which the, the failing was purely technical. There was no risk of loss of tax. Yeah. There was a number there to be provided. It just yes. wasn't provided at the right time and in the right place. Absolutely. Whereas here, yeah. it's an impossibility to provide it because they were never registered. They were never registered. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, both the absence of the VAT number and the absence of the customer happen to be relevant in this case on the approach of. The Africa General in Ziflet. And it's, um, she goes on in paragraph 83 to make clear that the possibility of deducting income tax is ruled out altogether, where one of the essential particulars is, is missing. Where are you? Uh, paragraph 83, um, how, from, the start, from the start, however, if the shortcoming on the invoice concerns, as in the present case, the circumstance of whether VAT is stated separately, which is one of the essential features of an invoice concerning right of deduction, the possibility to deduct income tax is ruled out for that reason alone. So you, you say that that applies to the omission of the customer name? If you were to find the Advocate General's opinion to be persuasive, um, we say that supports the Court of Appeals judgment in Ziflet. <coughs> it is not undermined by Ken Walter and Ferrimet, and that that would dispose of the first issue. The factual context of this, of our present appeal, needs to be borne in mind. 16 invoices were issued by Stratex to the appellant between the 18th of May 2009 and the 3rd of June 2009 for the supply of intangible property, namely carbon credit. And the VAT on those 
charging VAT to Cantor Fitzgerald Europe. Cantor Fitzgerald Europe's name was not on the invoice. Stratex became a missing trader and never accounted for that VAT. And the appellant reclaimed those sums on, that were stated on the invoice on its VAT return for the period of 06 09. The FTT held that Cowbridge did not know, nor did it have the means of knowledge, that the transactions with Stratex were connected with fraud. Nevertheless, it noted that the appellant had never checked whether Stratex was VAT registered or not. That's paragraph 328 at page 183. Sorry, which paragraph? Paragraph 328. Page 183. The FTT described the appellant as a leading multinational and profitable company with its own internal credit department, tax departments, and in-house legal advisors. That's paragraph 329. Uh, as well as having access to external expertise. I mean, they must all have been half asleep when these invoices came in. It's, <laughs> it's, all, it's almost unbelievable. The paragraph 330. Well, nobody's, nobody's challenged the FTT's findings of fact, by the way. If indeed it were possible to do so. We don't challenge the FTT's findings of fact. The test or, as your lordships know, for knowledge and means of knowledge is fairly um, stiff bar for the commissions to overcome. Um, but we're talking about something else, really, here. As the tribunal, as the FTT put it in paragraph 330, the absence of a VRM was a material indicator of fraud. Now, it might not have been sufficient to establish knowledge but nonetheless, it was a material indicator of fraud. There was a, and the tribunal goes on to find that there was a failure to take reasonable care on the part of the appellant, and a failing to conduct the most basic of checks. checks. And that is particularly relevant, we say, when it comes to whether the discretion under Regulation 29.2 should be exercised. So, why does this take? Requirements uh, to hold an invoice which state a VAT registration number and a customer's name are mandatory. Uh, Article 178 makes it a condition of exercising the right to deduct that such an invoice is held. So whilst the substantive conditions under Article 168A govern the existence of the right, the proof of that right, for my learned friend's phrase, depends upon compliance with Article 178 and Article 226. I think the Advocate General talks about the exercise of the right rather than the proof of the right. Yes. Um, although many of you have referred to evidence, um, the, the ability to evidence the right, which must be connected to proof of that right. But the, the phrase in Article 178, or the word, is, is the wording of Article 178 is exercise. Exercise, mm -hmm. yes. There is a discretion under Article 180 to accept alternative evidence to that provided by a compliant invoice. And we say that to be a genuine discretion, it's not enough to show simply that the substantive conditions are fulfilled. Because if that were the case, then there would be no purpose at all to having the formal requirement. And, and they aren't simply guidance, they're not simply when it comes to exercising the right to deduct. We've had uh, traversed in, in this matter a long list of EU cases which the appellant relies upon, which are examples in one context or another of technical failings where the payment of output tax by the supplier where the payment of output tax by the supplier was not in question, but it is here. 
and the respondents have pointed to other authorities from the Court of Justice, which shows that there are consequences if the formal requirements are not met. None of the Court of Justice's authorities address a situation like this one, where there's no VAT number on the invoice, no customer stated, where the supplier is completely unregistered, and where the VAT goes unpaid. Zipbit is the closest we have in terms of facts, um, and we say that the exhaustive analysis of the, the, the EU position uh, that was undertaken in Zipbit um, leads to exactly the, the, the right point and the right of the correct interpretation of the general principle that the invoice fulfills two very important functions. Evidencing the right to deduct and permitting the monitoring of the VAT system by the tax authorities. Just, just help me on that one because I'm not sure that I've quite grasp this. The person claiming to deduct will make the claim in a VAT return at the end of yeah, an accounting period. Mm. The invoice which he holds from the supplier will have been issued sometime during that accounting period, presumably, and he will have yeah. paid the Tax, the input tax on that supply. Yeah. HMRC, is this right? Won't see the underlying invoice unless they ask to see it. Um, it can happen that they, they do ask for invoices in, in real time, as it were, but that's quite unusual. I'm just concerned, I see about this monitoring. I, I can stuff. see, I, I, I see. It's all, it's all, it going. may all be a bit late when you've got a. Absolutely. A missing trader. <laughs> if they are VAT registered, <clears throat> they're able to be found much more quickly and efficiently. And what is known about them is likely to be far more than yeah. simply a name and address. Um, I think it's in Giesel or Barless where the um, Advocate General sets out why it's of assistance. Yeah, it's Giesel. He says, he says that you've got to get registered under 214. And yes. Yeah. So, it's certainly, if, if there is a VAT number on there, it, it assists the commissioners in tracking down that person and in finding out the scope and nature of their activity. Um, and that's never been, never been doubted. So, These particulars are not um, Article 226 particulars and are not all of that character, as um, Advocate General Picot uh, made, has made clear. For example, the nature of the supplies isn't fundamental to um, verifying the transaction uh, and checking uh, that the tax has been accounted for properly. But something like the VAT number and the customer's name are factors which are highly material to preventing fraud. Well, the nature of the supply could be. I mean, it um, depends on how you define it. But if you put carbon credits as opposed to postage to mail, mail order, yes, goods, um, yes, whatever, I think you might think that one of those requires a little bit more close attention than the other. Yes. Yes, there could be particular circumstances uh, where the nature of the supply could be very important. But yeah, yes. I mean, the, whole, the whole point about carousel fraud was that it depends upon easily um, Move. transportable, movable goods. I mean, it started out with the mobile phones mobile phones and chips, and then dealt with carbon credits, which frankly just zoom around the ether <laughs> intangibly many, yes. many times. Yes. Yeah. Um, some sectors are uh, of high risk and need to be, uh, I suppose I need to be yeah. kept on. Um, so yes, 
depending on the situation, it may well be that um, these conditions vary in their importance. Um, my Lords, we've gone through the, the EU cases in some detail. I'm not going to do that again because they're set out in the upper tribunal's decision. My, my Lord just Hanson considered those in good fit. Um, I'm not sure there's, a, there's anything, that you, unless there's anything that you want to ask me about any of those cases, which is really going to move the matter on. My general point is that they aren't cases where there was a fraudulent default and where the risk of that default was highlighted to the extent that we've got here. Except possibly Kenwater. We have no idea since the supplier couldn't be identified. It could well have been a, no. a default. I mean, that's quite a surprising case because how did they know there wasn't more than one supplier? There could have been lots of, lots of suppliers. Um, what, each one within the exemption? The low turnover? Not necessarily, but if if one takes the, the Kenwater doesn't refer to the monitoring function at all. No. So uh, on its basis, that, that's entirely irrelevant, um, which is surprising, um, given the attention that that subject's received um, in the previous case. I mean, it doesn't refer directly to the monitoring. It does refer back to a bar that's and probably some other cases where the monitoring function data arose. So maybe it I think Pyramid does, my lord, but I don't think Kenworth does. I, I'm sure you're right. I mean, that's certainly one of them, my recollection is. It does refer I think back at least to Bardis. Not, Ter not yes, it's yes, the second case. Kenworth refers to nothing apart from no. Pyramid. Yeah. Pyramid does refer to Bardis. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so those cases were not. What, we, what we're dealing with here. And yet, they acknowledge that um, the invoice performs a function that's more than simply decorative. Um, that it is not only evidence on which the admission ticket, as it were, but also uh, a vital function for the monitoring of that system. Going to move now to Regulation 29.2, unless there's anything arising more on, EU, uh, on the EU law issue, issue one. Now, the discretion issue arises if the appellant is not successful on its first point. And the appellant must show that HMRC acted in a way which no reasonable panel panel of commissioners could have acted, or that they've taken into account a matter that was irrelevant, or failed to take into account a relevant matter. These are standard public law grounds of challenge. Absolutely. The question, and the, the authority for that is, I'm not going to go there, but it's Housley. Um, well, I think it's common ground. Yeah, yeah so tab eight. So the factors that were considered in this case were there were invalid invoices and Stratex was not that registered. Well, those two go together. If Stratex were not that registered, then the invoices it issued could not be uh, valid. The transactions were connected to fraud. Uh, and lastly, the appellant failed to conduct reasonable due diligence. Now, the appellant's case here focuses on the words of Regulation 29.2, where it refers to other evidence of the charge to VAT being accepted by HMRC. And the, to that. And the appellant says that if, it's proved, if it has proved um, it's, it, the substantive conditions uh, exist, then that, it doesn't need to do anything else. Um, that is all that Regulation 29.2. However, the focus of that regulation is on whether there is such other documentary evidence of the charge to VAT as the Commission 
Just, back... help, just help me on what what is the charge to that? This arises on a claim by a taxable person to deduct input tax. Yeah. So is the charge to that in Regulation 29 referring to the charge to the taxable person on the supply in respect of which he's claiming to yes. deduct the input tax? Yes, my lord. Yeah. Right. So. In this case, it's the charge made by Stratex to CFE yes. that is the relevant charge to that. Yes. Is that how it works? Yes. And it's not limited to documents, is it? No, it isn't. Um, Such other evidence as the Commission... Yeah, you said the word documents. In the Sorry. So, no. You're quite right, my lord. Um, it is such other evidence as yeah. the Commission may have had. Um, but we're back to this topic of evidence. Um, we're back to the question of what evidence has been produced and whether the Commissioner's decision on that evidence is a reasonable one or not. Um, and the factors that HMRC may take into account are not limited under Regulation 29.2 or under any under Article 180 of the Directive. <coughs> so, what is the evidence to charge to that? Because the invoice is supposed to perform that function. But here we've been, we're in a situation in the territory where that invoice doesn't do that. Now, one might be in a situation where the goods aren't properly described. Maybe the, it just says um, supply of some bricks. And uh, the commissioner said, well, that, that doesn't tell us how many bricks. And the taxpayer says, well, here's our um, purchase order. You can see it was 10,000 bricks. And the commissioner said, OK, that's fine. We'll exercise our discretion. What, what is just, just so I've got it right? Um, the document which is required to be provided under Regulation 13 is what? That's the, that's that's the invoice. That's the 226 invoice. That's is it? I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's defined as a VAT invoice. Is yes. that defined somewhere by reference to 226? The I mean, it, article, you just go back to Regulation 13, it just talks about a VAT invoice. Yes. And is VAT invoice defined somewhere by reference to 226? Not, I mean, in UK law, if we I go... 14.1 has all the... 14.1 has what it should contain. Yeah. We just go to Regulation 29. But um, just going to Regulation 29, it looks as though there are two discretions which, the, which HMRC has. The primary obligation on the taxable person is to produce the document required by Regulation 13. So the first discretion which HMRC has is a discretion to direct either generally or in relation to this particular claim that other evidence may stand. May stand. And the second discretion is that it's for, that it's for HMRC to decide what kind of evidence. Yes. So there's a double discretion there. Yes. Should I make an exception to the rule? And if so? And if so, what? To answer my Lord and Justice Snowden's uh, question, I don't, I don't think there is any reference back to Article 226. This simply, this suite of, of regulations 29, 1, 13, and 14 um, enact what we have in Articles 178 and 226 into UK law. Um, so. The end of paragraph 20 of Regulation 29.1 refers to um, holding a document or invoice. And Regulation 29.2, at the time of claiming the deduction, um, the person shall, if the claim is in respect of the supply from another taxable person, hold the document which is required to be provided in the Regulation 13. So I think the expression of uh, that invoice comes in at 13, yeah, I, somewhat I un unheralded. Well, and undefined. 
just assume to know what it well, is. Well, it's undefined, although then in 14, he tells us exactly what the, what the document should contain. Just, just coming back for a moment to the point that I was putting to you a couple of minutes ago. Miss Shaw has concentrated on evidence of the substantive conditions, mm. what she called the substantive conditions of being satisfied. If, if the two-stage analysis is correct, then one might say, well, that's a question for stage two. Yes. The discretion, where, the discretion whether to make a direction at all is a stage one discretion. Yeah. And that, you say, is how you get in wider considerations than simply whether the, the substantive conditions have been fulfilled. Absolutely. Yes, my lord. Because an invoice does more than simply show that a taxpayer um, has purchased certain goods with VAT. It is the it's the it's almost, it's the first line of defence in the VAT system. Um, it was the starting point, so that the ta the authorities can ensure that that system is working correctly. Um, and hence, why it's quite why the, the requirements are prescriptive, both in Article Two Two Six and Regulation Fourteen. Um, there's a lot of information that, that needs to be set out. Um, and if the commission, there is, there are the two ifs, should the commissioners, if the commissioners accept that there should be alternative evidence, and if so, what, what should that be? So yes, that's why we say that there are wider considerations. In this case, it's relevant that Stratex, it's not just a Senatex situation where the VAT number wasn't on the invoice. Stratex weren't VAT registered. Um, that wasn't questioned by the appellant. Um, Stratex had no VAT number at all. It couldn't account for VAT. It, it, it was never going to be a, a world in which it accounted for VAT. This wasn't a technical deficiency or formal deficiency. It had real consequences. So that's why the fact that they weren't registered and the fact that the invoices were registered was a relevant consideration. The connection to fraud, why is that relevant? If one is given an invoice without a VAT number on for several hundred thousand pounds as here, one pays the VAT over without knowing or even apparently caring whether the person you're paying that to is even VAT registered and therefore has the ability to account for it. Then there's an obvious possibility of fraud. And why wouldn't that be a relevant consideration? Paying VAT to a trader without a VAT number raises the clear and present uh, danger of a fraudulent default. Uh, and, and I mean, from, a, from an individual's point of view, from the customer's point of view, from the taxpayer's point of view, um, I mean, they're really either concerned, aren't they, because they're either overpaying, because they shouldn't be being charged that, or alternatively, that somebody will come after them if there's a default. Yes. We don't have some general public spirited interest in ensuring that the supplier accounts for that. No, they don't. Um, ultimately, it must be a matter of self interest. And the risk is that uh, if they're paying VAT on an invoice without a VAT number, um, they will not be allowed their input tax deduction. Yeah, I mean, the risk of fraud, though, is from their perspective. 
is at one stage removed, whereas the risk of fraud from the revenue's point of view is it's direct. Direct. Yeah. It's, um, the it's the revenue who we're losing out, my lord. Yes. So if somebody gets an invoice which doesn't have a VAT number on it and has a sizable amount of that which is charged, what, what, what's it, it's how does that serve? It doesn't really serve directly the, the, the monitoring of fraud, does it? Because necessarily, as I understand it, necessarily the. Um, the revenue will not see this in real time. No, but doesn't it go? Maybe perhaps I haven't discussed myself very clearly. But they are the first line of defence. The, 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 the customer receiving that invoice has the opportunity to say, "Hold on." Yeah, it it, it it's likely to to ensure that fraud is as it were detected by somebody who isn't so much interested in detecting fraud, but is just interested in not. In not being penalised as a result, or over yeah overpaying and not being able to recover. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. The um, final matter is the lack of due diligence. Uh, no checks carried out on the Stratex VAT number by the appellant. Um, no checks at all. Uh, not this isn't an attempt to import to tell by the back door, however. I appreciate the point taken by my learned friend that that's what we're seeking to do here. Um, but we are not suggesting, or we're not seeking to go behind the finding of the FTT that there was no knowledge or means of knowledge. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, a lack of care on the appellant's part is not a relevant consideration. And the tribunal did find that there was such a lack. We know that the appellant had vast resources, um, but that it paid out five million in VAT on invoices with no VAT number. As one of the witnesses asked in the tribunal, how could that have happened? Uh, and no explanation was forthcoming. The company has never given an explanation as recorded at paragraph 341 of the FTT. We submit respectfully, as was noted in Zipvit, at paragraphs 116 and 117, there were no grounds in this case on which the HMRC could find that there was alternative, document, uh, alternative evidence of the charge to the VAT. All one had were these invoices, these non compliant invoices. And if all of those European cases that talk about the monitoring function state the position correctly, then the factors taken into account in this case by HMRC were entirely proper, proper and appropriate. Well, you, now you've referred back to Zipfit on this point, and Zipfit in this court. Um, Said that there wasn't. It doesn't really matter if there's. If you say there's no discretion, or the discretion could only be exercised one way. Is that your submission on the facts of this case, or do you say this is a case in which HMRC could have exercised their discretion either way, and it was proper for them to exercise it in the way they did? The reason I ask you is that if you put it in the first way, the zip fit way, then it wouldn't matter whether HMRC did or didn't make errors on the way to the ultimate decision. If they're, if sending it back would would make no difference. Would make no difference. Yeah. If on the other hand you say, well, they could have exercised lawfully exercised their discretion to allow the deduction, but equally they could lawfully exercise it so as to refuse the deduction, then it does make a difference whether we find errors on the way. I would respectfully submit that it must be the former, um, because on the facts of this case, there was nothing else. There was there was no one, uh, anything. There was nothing else on which HMRC could act. Um, so the discretion would have been. It, it's a zip-it situation, um, as with zip-it, where 
simply had the invoices, and it was acknowledged that there was no payment of the overdue. Well, I think Ms Shaw would say, well, you did have more than that. You, you knew from the volume and value of the transactions um, that uh, Stratex must have been a taxable person and therefore must have had that status. They must have done. Commissioners didn't know, however, whether those invoices had ever been used to commit fraud of anybody else and, and couldn't know that because that's all the, the only information they were given was, was the invoices. The appellant didn't put forward any anything else. Um, and whilst it might be said, well, well, it can be said, Stratex must have been a taxable person. That doesn't really go to, to the wider question about the monitoring function, ability of, the, of HMRC to, to track down Stratex, um, and the the risk of a, uh, those invoices being used elsewhere. Can I just check the minority? The monitoring function you talk about, and there's two different types of monitoring. Is that one is to detect fraud, and the other one is just to make sure that the right amount of VAT is paid? Yes. The, Closely related, but yeah. But not necessarily. Not necessarily, no. no, no. no. I mean, if it's a it, it's a broad remit. The, the monitoring function, yes, potentially covers a, a very wide. I mean, area. The, the revenue can monitor the, that the correct amount of VAT is being accounted mm -hmm. for. Yeah. By an honest yes um, supplier. Yeah. By looking at the invoices they've rendered to their customers. Presumably, also looking at the other end of the transaction if they want to check that the right <coughs> amount of money was paid, which they can do at the end of every VAT. Which they can do, sorry, at the end of every VAT quarter. Yes, yes, they can. Yeah. Um, detection of fraud is more difficult because it doesn't actually depend upon HMRC seeing the invoices in real time, because by the time they see them. It may be too late. too late. It's almost invariably too late. I mean, the whole point is the money will not be paid to HMRC when it's supposed to be paid. And by then it will be elsewhere. I wouldn't concede that it was um, a hopeless or a lost cause. Well, no, the longer, the longer you then detect the fraud, the worse the, it gets. The, the worse it gets, yeah. Um, but your ship's quite right. There are different aspects to the monitoring function. Um, but I think that they're both, I would submit that they're both um, highly material. Um, simply because time passes between the creation of the invoice and the, the submission of the back return doesn't mean to say that um, that monitoring function is somehow pointless. Or that aspect. Lords, I don't think there's anything else, but I'm more than happy to. Oh, sorry, I must have been prompted. Um, I was just, may I just read this, this note that I've been provided with? Yes. Thank you. Article 20 of the Statute of the CJU provides, um, and this is on um, the, the need for an AG to bring one on, where it considers that the case raises no new point of law, the court may decide after hearing the applicant general that the case shall be determined without a submission from the applicant general. Article, Article 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Of the Statute of the CJU. Do you get that on ULEX, can you? Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you have a reference number for it? Um, we'll just, will we send in a soft copy? Thank you. Yes, we, we will do. Yeah. Um, and uh, the issue of finding references to the CJU where the reference was made prior to the IP day, but judgment came later. 
that's Articles 86 and 89 of the EU Withdrawal Agreement, and that's referred to in the HMRC, in HMRC versus Perfect 2022 EWCA Civ 330 at paragraphs 13 to 16. So HMRC and Perfect. P U P P E. Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. Yes. Oh, perfect. Right. Yeah. What a splendid name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out to be rather optimistic. <laughs> <Less than perfect. laughs> yeah. Lorry driver. Yes, that, that's Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Newey. Yeah. Right. Paragraphs 13 to 16 of that. We'll send in a soft copy of the, the statute. Uh, and if there's any, of course, if there's any, if yeah. there is any. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, just on this, thank you for explaining the point about proceeding without hearing the AG at all. Was I also right when I said there is another possibility, which is doing it by means of a reasoned order? I can't quite remember what the criteria for that are, but I imagine that's an even yes, I think, I think Yes, I, 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 we think that there, there, is, there is that possibility. Um, well, I know I, it certainly used to exist. I remember in the FII litigation, quite extraordinarily, there were one or two cases where it was adopted by the, by the European Court. Perhaps we could send in a note which addresses um, um, the criteria. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. If you could agree the note with um, Miss Shaw, all the better. Yes. If you can't, oh, I'm well. sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> We're both reasonable people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Mr. Pusey. Yes, Miss Shaw, any reply? Just a handful of points. Um, so. We say it's not that Ferrame and Kenwater mark a change in the law. Um, they're not a new broom, as, as my learned friend put it. Ferrame and Kenwater are simply confirmatory um, of the propositions that have come before it um, and which emerge clearly from uh, the case laws, such as, uh, or in particular, Senatex and, and Vedan. Uh, as for Zipfit, um, the CJU decision is binding, um, as my learned friend has indicated. The AG is not binding. No, I think we, we agree that. AGs are never binding. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're not. But in particular, the AG in Zipfit was not picked up by the court no. on, on those particular paragraphs that my learned friend uh, relies upon. Um, and to the extent that she is saying that you need an invoice to exercise your right of, of, of deduction, then in our submission, that is simply wrong and runs contrary to uh, the propositions that I've already yeah. uh, take, taken you through. It's impossible to square that um, with what the court has said. Um, the true status of the, the invoice is that it goes to uh, or, or assists in the, in the tax authority's audit function. Um, and uh, that is essentially what the court picks up in Giesel uh, at 45, where it explains um, that the formal requirements are intended to facilitate uh, the audit. So that, we say, is the proper position in relation to the formal requirements, that they assist in the audit, um, the, 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 the audit function of the tax authorities. They are not, and the court has never said, that they <coughs> form part of the substantive requirements of the right to deduct. Um, in any event, and Malola Frank keeps saying that, that this is a zip fit situation. This is not a zip fit situation. The point in zip fit was that no VAT had been passed on to zip fit. It had not been charged, and nor had it duly paid any input tax whatsoever. Uh, whereas that is not the case here. Uh, it is common ground that we were charged and duly paid uh, the input tax in question. Uh, and then finally, on the question of whether there is one or two discretions within Regulation uh, 29, we say that there is only one discretion in Regulation 29.2 to accept other evidence of the charge to that. We say that there is no general discretion um, for the revenue to uh, refuse or deny the deduction simply because there is no valid that invoice. Um, and, and that is because if there were such a discretion, then that would 
again, we say be contrary to the case law which has said that provided the substantive requirements are met, the right to do that must be allowed, um, notwithstanding uh, a failure to comply with the formal requirements. So that general discretion, we say, would be incompatible with that position. Yeah. That's everything in reply. Many thanks. Right. Well, thank you very much for your very interesting arguments. I think there's a bit of wet towel around the head with this one. Um, so we will reserve our judgments. You will get draft judgments in due course. Um, as you will know, they come with a beefed up embargo, which means what it says. Um, we would hope that uh, in the light of the draft judgments and any typographical corrections that you make, uh, you will be able to agree in order disposing of the appeal. If you can't agree a form of order, please make short submissions in writing and we will make the form of order that we think is appropriate. Thank you all very much. My Lord, should we um, obtain your clerk's email address and also send them notes? Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Oh, well,